tissues are the living fabric of the body. And in the last chapter, we talked about cells. And when we mentioned the hierarchy of structure in the human bar body, we started with the chemical level, atoms, molecules, then we progressed to cells in chapter three. And now chapter four is talking about a group of cells with similar structure and function, which is a tissue. So there are four primary types of tissue. There's epithelial tissue, and just for a short little descriptor, an epithelium, epithelium as a whole, generally is a covering or a lining. Connective tissue is supportive. Usually connective tissue is under epithelial tissue. And then muscle tissue is the third group of tissues, and it provides movement. And then the fourth group is nervous tissue, and nervous tissue is controlling, uh, controlling tissue because it passes along electrical impulses from one place to another. Um, and so control is what its um, simplified definition is. So we'll start with epithelium. And epithelium has some functions. And the first one is protection. Nothing is more protective in the human body than the unbroken skin. So it's a barrier. Another thing that epithelium does is because it lines most things, it's, it's involved with absorption. So there's epithelia that line the GI tract that helps to absorb nutrients through the GI tract. Epithelium also makes up the nephrons, which are little filtration units that are found in the kidneys. Excretions, things are, substances are excreted through exocrine glands. These are glands that have ducts. Secretion is by way of ductless glands, which we refer to as endocrine glands. And we'll be spending a whole chapter on the endocrine system at the beginning of AMP2. There are some epithelial cells that are involved with sensory reception. And the example here is taste cells on the tongue. Now, there are five characteristics of epithelial cells. We talked about functions, but now we're going to talk about characteristics. So with epithelium, there is a polarity. And by polarity, that means that what's on one surface is generally different than what's on another surface. Usually, if the epithelium is on the outside of the body, the bottom layer attaches to connective tissue where the upper layer um, is exposed to the outside of the body. If it's a lining epithelium, then the lining tissue um, is usually connective tissue, and then that epithelium opens up into the opening of the passageway, like, say, the stomach or the intestines, and, and we call that opening a lumen, L-U-M-E-N. There's also specialized contacts, which we talked about in the last chapter. These are called cell junctions. Remember the tight junctions and um, the desmosomes and the gap junctions. And so epithelial tissue is all cellular. So all those cells have to be connected. And these are the three junctions that we referred to in, in chapter three. And epithelium is supported by connective tissue. And that's a good point to remember. So if you're looking at a tissue under the microscope or you're looking at a, a histological section, you can very easily um, pick out the epithelium because it's the innermost or outermost layer. And underneath that would be some type of connective tissue. Avascular means doesn't have a blood supply, but it does have a nerve supply. Okay, so avascular, but innervated and it can regenerate and actually epithelial tissue is the most rapidly dividing tissue in the body and people that are in, on chemo recognize this because when you are on chemo chemo targets rapidly dividing tissue and not only is the cancer affected but also a lot of your skin hair doesn't grow the same uh, you get gi tract disturbances because the lining is epithelium a lot of things happen because of um, the destruction of the rapidly dividing cells of the all right, so classification of epithelia, the epithelium has two names. The first one indicates the number of layers of epithelia that are there. If it's one layer, it's called a simple epithelium. If it's two or more layers, it's called a stratified epithelium. 
the second name indicates the shape, and there are three shapes. Either the epithelial cells are flattened, or they're cuboidal, cube-shaped, or it's columnar or elongated. And here is a look at the three different shapes. Here's your squamous. And you can see the nucleus appears different in all three of these. Here the nucleus looks flat, cuboidal, the nucleus is perfectly round, and then in your columnar cells, um, it's kind of elongated. So these are the types of epithelium. We're going to run through them. I'll give you some, uh, I'll talk a little bit about them and tell you where they're most commonly found. So for a lecture, you want to make sure that when you're studying for the lecture test, you have an idea of where this epithelium is located and characteristics of the epithelium. So here's this little sheet of epithelium, simple, one layer. And generally, a good example of where this is found is in the alveoli or the little air sacs in the lungs. It's simple squamous epithelium. One layer, flat epithelium, alveoli of the lungs. It's found in other locations, but for right now, that's where I want you to know that it is. Simple cuboidal epithelium. Again, one layer of cells, okay? Single layer, cube-like cells with large spherical central nuclei. And where I want you to remember this is in the kidney tubules. And you can see them there. They're cut cross-sectionally and you can see the nuclei, and you can see the lumen in the middle, but you can see there are cube-shaped cells. And for a secretion and absorption, because um, filtration through the kidneys involves filtering out 180 liters of fluid derived from plasma every single day, a lot of filtration to take out toxins. Um, and most of what's filtered gets reabsorbed back into the blood. Okay, so kidney tubules, simple cuboidal epithelium. Simple columnar, simple columnar lines the GI tract, and it has the microvilli, those little finger-like projections that increase surface area to maps, maximize absorption. You'll also see in these passageways little cells embedded within the passageways that are called mucus-producing uh, mucus cells that are called goblet cells. And these goblet cells produce the mucus that allow for easier passage of, of uh, food substances and residue through the GI tract. So GI tract, simple columnar epithelium. Then we have what's called pseudostratified columnar, columnar epithelium. Now the word pseudostratified means falsely stratified. It looks like there's many layers, but actually it's not. They all touch both surfaces. They just have different shapes that make them look like they're multi-layered. And where you find this is in the respiratory tract in the trachea. And the trachea has cilia at its, at its surface and the cilia is embedded in mucus and it helps to keep um, saliva, mucus from going down into the respiratory passageways. So it helps to beat towards the mouth and uh, then you swallow this. So ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium is what you generally find in the respiratory tract. Now there's stratified squamous epithelium. So now we actually have multiple layers and there's two types. There's the keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, which is, which, which is a dry membrane like you would find on the surface of the skin. Okay, so this is keratinized stratified squamous, and the outer layers of cells are dead. Now, non-keratinized stratified squamous, and here they're showing you a picture of the uh, esophagus, um, this is a type, it's a wet lining, okay? So it's not dry like the keratinized on the skin, but where I want you to remember this is found is in the vagina because a lot of the uh, examples that you find like in the lab slides if those of you who are in the hybrid lab section you'll see that um, they uh, the pictures come from a section of the vagina so that's the non keratinized type this is a wet membrane dry membrane then we have transitional epithelium this is a multiple layer again the cells are kind of rounded almost look dome shaped 
and um, this is found primarily in the urinary tract so in the ureters and in the bladder and this can stretch so um, when the bladder is filling up these cells look more elongated and when the bladder is in a collapsed position then they look more dome shaped so they're kind of in transition depending upon what's going on with these passageways so transitional would be the bladder or urinary system now let's move on to glands and glands are another um, offshoot of epithelium because your glands are made of epithelial tissue so there's two types endocrine doesn't have any ducts and we're going to spend a whole chapter in AMP2 on the endocrine system so I'm just putting them here so you know where they where they fit into the scheme of things we're talking more here about exocrine glands that have ducts and again the cell type that makes up the, up the ducts or make up these uh, glands are epithelial tissue now you can classify exocrine glands by the type of secretion they produce so merocrine glands make up most of your exocrine glands they secrete products by exocytosis as produced so sweat glands um, are your major type of merocrine glands so they you have sweat glands all over the body so that's your most common type holocrine glands are the type that accumulate products within them and then they rupture and your sebaceous glands or oil secreting glands are an example of this type of gland and then apocrine glands um, accumulates products within but only the outside ruptures and these are um, characteristic of glands that are associated with the axial region of the body and the anal genital region of the body and these are involved with producing uh, possibly body odor in some people but they metab they produce more fat within them with uh, merocrine you don't really have that sweat usually doesn't uh, it's an accumulation of just water-based solution that comes from the cells uh, of the skin and um, it contains some urea some uric acid some lactic acid but usually not associated with body odor these are a little bit different and um, have the metabolites of fat and protein that accounts for body odor now we're going to move from epithelium to connective tissue and connective tissue makes up the largest group of tissues in the body it's the most abundant and widely distributed of the primary tissues and here's the first thing I want you to keep in mind about connective tissue epithelial tissue was all cells okay all cells connected together in a colony and a group connective tissue very few cells okay and those cells are embedded in something called a non-living matrix so you don't have as many cells in connective tissue as you do in epithelium epithelium is all tissues this has a lot of non-living stuff with it so when it comes to regenerating this tissue doesn't regenerate as fast as epithelial tissue does because the cells is where the DNA is that will um, create your uh, information to make the proteins and if you don't have as many cells you can't make as much protein that fast so it's slower to repair so four major classes connective tissue proper cartilage bone and blood functions of connective tissue holds things together remember it supports the epithelium so you have epithelium usually at the top or inner lining of a tissue and then you have uh, connective tissue and then usually surrounding that or beneath that is muscle so that's your order epithelium connective muscle okay now protection connective tissue has a lot of collagen fibers in many cases tendons ligaments um, cartilage all these tissues have a lot of collagen fibers durable protective um, insulation adipose tissue um, is a great insulating tissue um, storage reserve adipose tissue stores fat which is an energy source and then there's one type of connective tissue that's used as a transportation highway and that's the blood it moves things around the body makes sure that cells get their nutrients and oxygen and also carries away waste products from those metabolized cells okay so what is connective tissue made up of 
we said that there wasn't many cells. So what else is there? Well, the cells are embedded in ground substance. And the ground substance is a water-based medium or fluid in between the cells. But it can be more dense or thin depending upon the amount of proteins that make it uh, a little bit thicker or denser, like gristle. Gristle has a lot of these proteins. Now these proteins are called glycosylated proteins and it's like a thickener that you would put into a patient's um, beverage at a nursing home that has trouble swallowing. And if they're afraid of fluid going the wrong way, they'll put this thickener in there. So you can make put in a lot of thickener and make that into a solid blob, or you can put a little bit in and just uh, make it a little bit uh, denser than water. So these proteins can make it either very dense or very thin, depending upon the protein. So that ground substance may be water-based, but it could be very dense. Then there are fibers that are embedded in the ground substance. And the three types of fibers are, I'll give them to you real quick and then we'll talk about them, but we have collagen and we have elastic and then we have reticular fibers. So we'll discuss those in a minute. And then there are cells that are in this tissue and the cells have names depending upon what type of connective tissue it is. Now the composition and the arrangement. So the composition, how much ground substance, how thick it is, what type of fibers, how many fibers, how many cells you have, depends on the type of connective tissue that it is. So connective tissue fibers, I briefly mentioned them, but these three types of fibers provide support. Collagen is the strongest and most abundant type of, of type of fiber that you have. Remember back in chapter two, we said it was a triple braid, a very strong fiber, resists tearing, and it produced very high tensile strength. And that word tensile means resist tearing. Elastic fibers, these are long, thin fibers that have the ability to be stretched and recoil. And then reticular fibers are for our short, fine, highly branched collagenous fibers, but they're much thinner than collagen, and they allow more give, and they branch. Now let's talk about the cells. You have two types of cells based on their maturity. The immature cells are called the blast cells. I call blast cells baby cells. And then your mature cells are called sites, okay? So your blast cells are immature, they are mitotically active, and they help to secrete the non-living matrix, the ground substance and the fibers. Because remember, the non-living stuff is the ground substance and the fibers. The living stuff is the cells, okay? So most of this tissue is non-living. So these cells have to keep the ground substance, take care of the yard. So they got to take care of the fibers, they got to take care of the ground substance. So if you're talking about connective tissue proper, the cell type is a fibroblast. If you're talking about cartilage, it's a chondroblast. And if you're talking about bone, it's an osteoblast. So I would make sure that you put this all together, write this down someplace or or you know, make, make sure you have this together somewhere so you know which tissue type, what the name of the cells are. And then the fourth category is blood. And so your hemopoietic stem cells, also called hemocytoblast, H-E-M-O-C-Y-T-O-B-L-A-S-T, hemocytoblast give rise to your mature blood cells. Now, if they're mature cells, then they're called sites. So chondrocytes are in cartilage, osteocytes are in bones, as, as an example. So there's the cells, what their names are for each type or each division of connective tissue. And please keep those straight because you're going to need those for the test. Um, types of connective tissue, starting with connective tissue proper. This contains every type of connective tissue except bone, cartilage, and blood. Now there are two subclasses. This is the hardest one to wrap your head around, but if you do write this down, practice it, you can get it. 
Now you either have loose connective tissue or you have dense connective tissue. And these two groups are underneath connective tissue proper. Okay. The cell type again is the fibroblast. All these have fibroblasts for cells. Um, and we'll talk about what their composition is. So areolar, adipose, and reticular, those three fall under the loose connective tissue category. And we're going to look at them uh, individually in a minute. Dense connective tissue, these two, dense regular, dense irregular, the major tissue type, major fiber type in these two is collagen fibers. These vary, okay? But these two is collagen fibers. So again, connective tissue proper, two subcategories, loose connective tissue. That includes areolar, adipose, reticular. Dense connective tissue, dense regular, dense irregular. Now let's talk about them. Here's areolar connective tissue under your loose connective tissue proper okay so all your fiber types you have collagen fibers you have elastic fibers you have the fine reticular fibers here a lot of open ground substance this I call the universal packing material it is found everywhere and it's found in between muscle fiber groups and makes up the fascia. So the fascia that's involved with uh, fasciitis, it can take on fluid. It's a very thin tissue. So areolar, um, areolar connective tissue, universal packing material, you find it everywhere. Widely distributed under epithelia of the body. So you will find it all over the place. This is adipose tissue, the next group under loose connective tissue, under connective tissue proper. Adipose, for the most part, is unusual with connective tissue. We said the connective tissue is mostly non-cellular with a little bit of non, mostly non-cellular with very few cells, right? This is the exception to the rule. Adipose tissue is 90% cellular with very little non-living matrix. So you can see here, mostly all cells and it's mostly fat. And the fat it occupies so much of the cell that squeezes all the organelles out to the side. And so there's your fat droplet that takes up most of the volume. So it's a protective tissue, mostly cellular, um, and it's involved with reserving Food, fuel, insulation, supports, protects organs. And then your third type of loose connective tissue is your reticular. So it's made up of reticular fibers. And this type of tissue allows cells, living cells, to move around and come and go. So where you would find this is in the spleen. Lymph nodes is another place where you'll find it. Bone marrow. So there's many different organs that have um, reservoirs of immune cells or stem cells to produce blood cells. And this is where you will find reticular type tissue because this matrix supports a environment that will allow cells to move around. And that's because of the reticular fibers forming like a net. Okay, so reticular tissue, um, spleen is where I'd want you to. Now we go to, we're still under connective tissue proper, but now we're under dense connective tissue. So the first one is dense regular connective tissue. So very few cells, okay, and a lot of collagen fibers. And all the collagen fibers are going in the same direction. So it resists pull. This looks like a rope. And where you find dense regular connective tissue is tendons and ligaments, okay? And tendons attach muscle to bone, and ligaments attach bone to bone. So it's very, very strong tissue, lots of collagen fibers, and helps to hold muscles to bones and bones to bones. Dense irregular looks kind of swirly because the collagen fibers are going in multiple directions. And here it's showing you a joint capsule and where they're found. But because we're going to go into the skin next, I want you to remember that you find dense irregular connective tissue in the dermis of the skin because that leads right into what we're going to talk about in the next chapter. Now we're going to go to cartilage. Cartilage 
again, very few cells. And a non-living matrix is pretty tough. And because of that, the cells are in these little openings in the tissue that are called lacunae. So here's the lacunae, and the cells look like little eyeballs sitting in there. But in this tissue, there's three types of cartilage, but the first type is called hyaline. Hyaline cartilage, you don't really see any visible fibers. And it's found um, in costal cartilages, ends of long bones, um, and it makes up what you would consider, if you're eating a piece of meat and you run into gristle, that's hyaline cartilage. Very, very tough, tough cartilage. So ends of long bones and costal cartilages. And it's found other places, but I'm just giving you a couple examples. And no visible fibers. And the word hyaline means ground glass, because it does kind of look like ground glass, because you don't see any fibers. Very uniform. Elastic cartilage. Again, you see the lacunae, and you see the, the cells in the little pits. But you have the addition of some fibers here, and these fibers are elastic fibers. So it lets this tissue be very pliable. You can bend it around, twist it around, it bounces back into shape. And it's what makes up the inner cartilage of your external ear. It also makes up the flap that we call the epiglottis that folds over the larynx. So E, elastic, stands for ear and epiglottis, but if you remember ear, you can't go wrong. The third type is fibrocartilage. And the fibers that you'll find here are very, very thick bands of, of collagen fibers. Again, lacunae with the cells. And remember the cells that you find in cartilage are called chondroblasts, right? So you want to keep that in mind. And this type of tissue resists compression. It's very, very strong. So intervertebral discs have a capsule um, that surrounds the disc that's made up of fibrocartilage. So it helps to resist compression. Also, you'll find it in the knee. Cartilage is in the knee because the knee is a joint that takes a big beating. And so it helps to resist compression there. Now we're going to our third group of connective tissue, and this is bone. So bone there's a couple types of bone. There's spongy bone and there's compact bone. But this is, um, this is compact bone. And it looks kind of like tree trunks that are all cut. And you can see them stacked up here. We're going to spend three chapters talking about bones and joints. So I'm not going to expand upon it here. Just to uh, know that bone is a category under connective tissue. It's also called osseous tissue. And... Um, uh, osteoblast is the cell type that we mentioned earlier, okay? So I'm not going to expect you to know more than that not right now. The last group under connective tissue is blood. And blood is your only tissue that's in a liquid form in the body. It's, it's involved in transportation of substances. And you see here's a smear that shows you red blood cells, white blood cells. That's a lymphocyte. That's a um, neutrophil and showing you little platelets and um, so it is involved with transportation the cell is the cell in this that we're going to use as a generalized stem cell is the hemocytoblast or um, hemo uh, pluripotential cell um, but you don't have to know about that much now just know that blood's in the category with all your other connective tissue because we're going to spend a whole chapter on this in a and P2, okay? Now we go to muscle. So we're done with epithelium. We're done with connective, all right? And you saw how involved connective was, so spend some time there. Now we're going to talk about muscle tissue. Muscle tissue is highly vascularized. It's a great blood supply and responsible for most types of movement in the body. Here's your three different types. Skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Skeletal muscle is all of your, your muscle groups that involve movements of different parts of the body. Cardiac muscle, the heart. Smooth muscle lines most of your hollow organs and involved with their movement and their support. Uh, blood vessels too. Blood vessels, uh, large blood vessels have a core smooth muscle. So here's some of the characteristics. Skeletal, striated, See these bands right there? Looks like a candy cane. That's skeletal muscle. That's characteristic for that type. They're long cells. 
They can be as long as a foot in length. They can go the entire length of the muscle. They have multi-nucleated arrangements, meaning that there's many, many nuclei, and they're voluntary. You control them. Heart, again, you see they're striated. They're branched, so you can see they tend to branch off. There could be one to three central nuclei, and these are involuntary. You don't control the heart. Smooth muscle, you don't see any striations there. There's a single central nucleus, and these, again, are involuntary. So be familiar with the various characteristics, and we have three different types of muscle involved with movement. Nervous tissue, here's neurons. And this is a generalized neuron that shows you the nerve cell body. And um, there's incoming processes called dendrites and a single outgoing axon. We're going to be spending quite a few chapters on nervous tissue. So I just want you to know that it is a tissue type. It is the fourth and last type of tissue that we're going to talk about. And it's found in the brain, spinal cord, and nerves. And its job is to carry electrical impulses from one place of the body to the other. So there are names given to groups of tissues put together. Um, and if you have two primary groups of tissues together, you can call these a covering and lining membrane. And usually it's an epithelium that's bound to an underlying connective tissue proper. They are simple organs, and there are three types. The skin, where you have the epidermis and the dermis, that's called the cutaneous membrane. In mucus line passageways inside the body, like through the digestive tract and um, respiratory tract, those are called mucus membranes, so whatever the epithelium is with the uh, mucus-producing tissue. And then serous membranes we talked about in Chapter 1, where you have your parietal layer and your, and your uh, visceral layer and support of areolar connective tissue that helps to make these membranes that reduce friction in areas where you have organs that move. So just to, just to let you know, I'm not going to test you on these, but just to give, let you know there are names given to these different types of double membraned um, tissues that you have in various areas, whether it's the skin, mucus passageways, or serous membranes. Now, tissue repair. When barriers are penetrated, cells must divide and repair and recover the function of that tissue. And it, recurs, it occurs in two major ways. If you get regeneration, that means the same kind of tissue replaces the tissue that was destroyed and the original function is restored completely. That's regeneration. Now, if you get something called fibrosis, the connective tissue replaces destroyed tissue and original function is lost. This generally, generally refers to when you have scarring. If you have a severe burn and you have scarring that results, and a lot of times when you have fibrous connective tissue that replaces that original tissue like the skin, you don't have the flexibility. Sometimes if you have scarring that occurs in a joint, you can't move it as well because the regular epithelium is very stretchy. It's very has a lot of give. So um, it can cause limitation of movement. So here's what happens. So we have to talk about the first thing. Here's a breach in security here, so you have a break, okay? So the first thing that happens is inflammation sets the stage. The severed blood vessels, they start to bleed. And when they bleed, they release inflammatory chemicals. And these inflammatory chemicals allow the blood vessels to become more permeable. So they open up the blood vessels. And this allows your white blood, blood cells to leave and fluid to leave. Clotting protein leaves the blood. And other plasma proteins seep into the injured area. And these substances set up the stage for repair. Clotting occurs because your clotting proteins are released with this fluid. This, is called, this fluid is called exudate. And so clotting occurs, the surface dries, and you get the formation of a scab. And all, this, all these elements actually come from the damaged uh, blood vessels surrounding the tissues. Second thing is organization, and that's going to restore the blood supply. So the clots replaced by granulation tissue, 
which restores the vascular supply. So you can see here, I don't have anything with the leaders, but you can see here that the fibroblasts in the area are going to start to produce more collagen fibers, which is going to kind of stitch up the area and bring those separated areas together. So fibroblasts produce collagen fibers that bridge the gap. Macrophages in the area, these are your macrophages in here, okay? They come along and they eat up say phagocytize, the dead and dying cells and other debris. So they clean, clean up the mess. And then these are neutrophils. Neutrophils come in and they knock out the bacteria that may try to get in from the outside. So, and then at, at the end, the surface epithelial cells multiply, you see them multiplying, and they migrate over the granulation tissue. So it starts to fill in. And then the last process is, regeneration and fibrosis affect the permanent repair. So the fibrous area matures and contracts. So this is the fibrous area here. The epithelium is going to thicken and a fully regenerated epithelium overgrows this underlying scar area. So actually if you were able to rip off the epithelium, because a lot of times the epithelium will cover up any damage that you have and you won't even notice that you've ever had an injury there. But underneath, that connective tissue will always show where the injury was. So there's always a scar there. So regeneration here, scarring underneath. So that's the, uh, that's the end of tissue repair. So when we think about all the different tissues that we talked about, some of them can repair very quickly, some of them very slowly, and some of them none at all. So let's talk about the regenerative capacity of different tissues. The ones that regenerate very well, epithelial tissue we know, we know is the most rapidly dividing tissue in the body. Bones repair very quickly. Areolar connective tissue does repair very quickly. That's the universal packing material. Dense irregular connective tissue, which is what you find in the dermis of the skin, Blood forming tissue, that's, that type of tissue repairs pretty quickly too. Moderate regenerative capacity, smooth muscle, and dense regular connective tissue. Now we're talking about tendons and ligaments. Ah, eh, slower, okay? And sometimes with tendons and ligaments, remember you've heard the old saying, you'd be better off breaking a bone than you, will, than you would to damage a tendon or a ligament because it takes forever. So they're a little bit slower and virtually no functional regenerative capacity, cardiac muscle. If you have a myocardial infarction and you have cells that die, they're gone, you're not getting them back. And if you have an injury in the brain or spinal cord, you don't get back function there either. But they're doing some research that can indicate that maybe there can be some regeneration or coaxing these cells to regenerate um, in some patients who have suffered traumatic injuries. Here's a list of uh, terms for tissues, just some words to throw out there. Some of these you may have heard of before, but apoptosis, programmed cell death, we talked about that in the previous chapter, speaking to uh, lysosomes and what their function was. Atrophy, loss in cell size and number. Uh, Decubitus ulcer is another name for a bed sore. Gangrene is a term for tissue death resulting from insufficient blood supply. Hyperplasia, increase in the number of cells. Don't confuse this with hypertrophy, an increase in the size in cells. Okay, so one's the increase in number, one's the increase in size. And infarction is a sudden tissue, tissue death due to a blockage in the blood vessel uh, that impairs the blood flow. Metaplasia change from one type of mature tissue, uh, tissue type to another. Necrosis, mature, mature tissue death due to trauma, toxin, etc. And neoplasia, development of a tumor. So just some, some terms associated with tissues. Where do these tissues come from? All your tissues actually come from early development from the primary germ layers that you would find after the fertilized egg has evolved into a structure called a gastrula. And it's early in embryonic development. So there's three tissues, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And these three tissues will give rise to the four primary tissues. 
Nerve tissue arises from ectoderm. Muscle and connective tissues arise from the mesoderm. Meso means middle, and those are in the middle. And then epithelial tissue can arise from all three germ layers. Now, that is a breakdown of where these tissues come from, and we have finished chapter four.